Now, who do you think are the greatest recipients of welfare in our country today? I think it's poor people. It's the super rich. It's Wall Street. It's AIG. $182 billion bailout. $182 billion. Let me tell you how much that is. Up until 2008, $182 billion was four times greater than the Department of Education's budget for the entire country. This year, for example, we're going to be spending over $200 million on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Wars that were not declared, wars that we're not paying for, we're letting our children and grandchildren do it. This is, these are the first wars where taxes were reduced on the wealthy. Usually they increase the tax to pay for the war. When Congressman David Ogley from Wisconsin put in a bill saying there should be a war tax last year to pay for Iraq and Afghanistan, it's enough we don't have a draft. The Democratic leadership turned their back on him. And he's been in Congress 34 years. That's one, these are some of the reasons where you have 47 million people without health insurance. You have about 50 million people who make Walmart wages, seven and a half, eight, nine, ten, ten and a half dollars an hour before deductions. Uh, the minimum wage today, the federal minimum wage is $7.25. If you index the minimum wage in 1968, when worker productivity was 60% of what it is today, if you indexed it to inflation the way members of Congress index their salary to inflation, you'll be $10 an hour, $7 and a quarter. The highest wage level in American history for most people in this country was 1973, adjusted for inflation. This is why people think America's in decline. It's industries and jobs are being exported under these malicious trade agreements to communist and fascist regimes abroad, like China, who know how to keep workers in their place, don't they? Try starting an independent union in China, and you're in jail. At least, you're in jail. And the wages they pay in China are not living wages. They're repressive wages. And they have modern equipment, and they work their heads off, and they ship the products back to the U.S., and this is supposed to be advantageous. Where we ship our auto supply industry there, we ship our auto industry to Mexico and to China, Malaysia, and so on. We're shipping our electronics industry over. What's left? Anything that can work through software, anything that hardworking People abroad, at surf labor, who have no rights, terribly unsafe conditions. They have to work sometimes 80 hours a week, no overtime. If they object in one Walmart supplier in China, they were fined three days wages and told if they didn't do what they were told, they were out. This is one of the supply factors. Walmart brings in $20 billion a year of products from China. The head of Walmart makes $11,000 an hour, every hour, eight hours a day, five days a week. The workers, most of the workers are making under 10, 50, 10, 9, $8 an hour. How does he get so much money? Because he's got a rubber stamp board of directors. You think he earned it? They wine and dine the board of directors. They give them a big per diem for their few days a year at the board meetings, and then they approve the compensation package. It's a nice life. So we come down to what are we going to do about this? Number one, we got to think about it. We don't think enough about corporate power. The more we read, the more outraged we get. For example, you can say, yeah, I know they rigged the tax system. Everybody knows these big corporations, they got the tax system rigged. But when you see how they do it, and they see how it increases your own taxes or reduces the services, when you see how grossly unpatriotic they are, 
that they don't give a damn about the United States of America, even though the company started here and were risen to profit on the sweat of the workers and bailed out when they're in trouble in Washington and defended by the U.S. Marines when they get into hot spots abroad. But when it comes to any kind of loyalty to our country, it's the dollar sign. And if it's the foreign, foreign currency sign, they're off. They'll shut down the plants, tell someone who's been on the job for 35 years, clean out your desk or your locker, we're through. Sometimes they bring in the foreign workers and they force the workers here to train these workers to replace their jobs when the factory is shipped to Guangdong province in China. Think of the humiliation, the disrespect. Now what is astonishing about the American people is how low their expectation level is. It's the lowest expectation level in the Western world. Because in the Western world, after World War II, where Europe, Western Europe was devastated, France, Belgium, Netherlands, England, Italy, Germany, pulverized, they rose up and through their trade unions, multi-party system, not two parties, and their cooperatives, look what they got for all their people. Watch this checklist. They got for all their people as part of a productive economy that we don't have any of it today for all our people. Prepare to be shocked. Universal health insurance, no pay or die system, all their people. Minimum four weeks paid vacation, whether they're unionized or not, all their people. In Sweden, it's seven weeks paid vacation. They work to live, they don't live to work. Paid daycare, paid family sick leave, tuition-free university education, labor laws that allow a reasonable prospect of workers getting together for collective bargaining, not draconian laws like our Taft-Hartley law of 1947. Decent public transit. And for the bottom one-third of the workers in Western Europe, they're paid more and they have pensions. Not to mention full health insurance, family sick leave, daycare, paid vacation, decent public transit, well-kept parks, etc. How come they did it? We didn't do it. Our expectation levels driven by a fundamentalist market psychology and ideology, is at rock bottom level. Eugene Debs, a great leader of American workers, between 1880 and 1920, we, we all read about it, and don't we, in the history books? When he was, at the end of his career, a reporter, by the way, this is a man who could take a train from Baltimore to Chicago to speak to workers in an open field, and 200,000 of them showed up. This is a man who spoke out against World War II, and for his freedom of speech, Woodrow Wilson's attorney general put him in jail. He ran for president and got a million votes, which is equivalent to five million today. So he was not an insubstantial person. He was asked by a reporter at the end of his career, Mr. Debs, what's your greatest regret? And Deb said, my greatest regret? My greatest regret is the American people under the Constitution can have almost anything they want. But it just looks like they don't want much of anything at all. 